So hi, everyone. Um, today we have Dima Kogan as our speaker. He's going to talk about his work, Private Information Retrieval with Sublinear Online Time. This work won the best um, Young Researcher Paper Award last year. Let's welcome Dima. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really happy to, to give the talk. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about the private information retrieval with sublinear online time. And this is joint work with my co-author, Henry Corrigan Gibbs. And just, just I'm, a, I'm a PhD student at Stanford and uh, working with Dan Bonnet. So private information retrieval is a cryptographic protocol between a server that holds a database and a client that wants to query a particular uh, a particular record from this database. And the protocol allows the client to read this, to read this record without the database serving, server learning which record the client is retrieving. And throughout this talk, we will mostly uh, model our databases as n-bit arrays, meaning every record is just a single bit. However, in the literature, there are standard extensions that, uh, that support databases with uh, larger record sizes, as well as provide more realistic interface of a key value store or a dictionary rather than that of a plain array, like we'll consider through the most of this talk. And private information retrieval is useful for, application where, uh, for applications where the user's query contains some sensitive information. So for example, uh, a patient that wants to query a uh, medical encyclopedia might want to avoid revealing his exact disease to the database operator, or a user's uh, query to a database of stock prices might contain some sensitive information about the user's uh, financial interests. And moreover, uh, PIR is also used as a building block in larger privacy preserving systems. And I will give a, an example of one such system uh, in the second part of my talk. So uh, to be a bit more precise, the requirements of a PIR protocol are first correctness, meaning that an honest client interacting with an honest server should learn the correct value of its bit of interest, at least with some overwhelming probability. And second, we require security, meaning that a malicious server should learn nothing about which index the client is reading. And as always in cryptography, we can, form, we can formalize it by saying that for any database X and any pair of indices I and J, the view of the server when the client is reading bit I should be computationally indistinguishable from the view when the server is reading bit J. So if these are the only two requirements, there is actually a trivial protocol that satisfies both of them. Namely, the client could just download the database in its entirety to, to the client's uh, local machine and then perform the lookup locally. And remember, this makes sense because in this setting, the, there are no privacy requirements on the server side. So it's only the, the client's privacy that we care about. However, uh, this trivial protocol is first not very interesting from a theoretical perspective, but it's also uh, kind of very unsatisfying from a practical perspective because downloading the entire database um, is, uh, consumes too, too, too much bandwidth and can be impractical uh, for, for, for large databases. So to make the problem, uh, to, make, to make the problem uh, have more sense, we also require that the protocol tries to minimize the total communication between the client and the server. So, and it turns out that if, uh, if, these, are, if these are the requirements, there's actually, uh, there's actually good protocols that meet them. In particular, in the same work by Shor, Goldrach, Kushilevitz, and Sudan that introduced uh, PIR, the authors also show the solution that solves the problem by replicating the database between two or more non-colluding servers. And ever since, there's been a long line of work gradually improving the communication complexity uh, in this multi-server setting. And today, we have protocols that provide information theoretic security uh, with n to the little, little o of one communication complexity. And if one is willing to settle on computational security, then more recent protocols even achieve uh, logarithmic communication complexity. Moreover, uh, soon after the original work that introduced PIR, Kushilevitz and Ostrovsky showed that you don't actually need to make 
cryptographic assumptions. Uh, sorry, you don't, you don't actually need to replicate the database if you are willing to make cryptographic assumptions. So in this single server setting, today there are protocols that achieve polylogarithmic communication complexity from a wide range of public key uh, assumptions. So looking at the slide, it seems that the situation is very good in terms of communication. Those protocols provide excellent communication complexity. However, it's fair to ask, what about the computational complexity of these protocols? And it turns out that if you look at those protocols, in all of them, the server actually needs to linearly scan the entire database before responding to a query. And this linear amount of work uh, on a query is actually a barrier to deployment because you can imagine is, it, it's kind of similar to as if we're running a database without an index and you just have to do linear scans uh, on, on each query. And to make, make things worse, uh, there's actually a lower bound. So Beim, Elishai, and Malkin showed that uh, the server has to do linear work in order to respond to a query. And the intuition behind this lower bound that if the server, while responding to a query, doesn't touch a particular bit in the database, then the server can learn that the client cannot be reading this particular bit that the server uh, even uh, haven't touched at all. And this leaks some partial information about the index to the server. So that's the intuition, but you can actually formalize it. And uh, this applies even to uh, the setting where you have multiple non-colluding servers and uh, irrespective of whether uh, of, of any cryptographic assumptions. So this is kind of a very strong uh, lower bound. Does, so, that, does that lower bound hold even if you allow for a negligible failure? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's, the, yeah. Um, so the, after, after this work, there's been several works that try to somehow circumvent, uh, circumvent this lower bound to do, to somehow make progress, uh, on reducing the communicate, the, sorry, the computation of PIR. In particular, in that same work that showed the lower bound, uh, Beimel et al showed, uh, a very promising approach that's called PIR with pre-processing. Here, the server uh, initially encodes, encodes the database, and instead of storing the database in its original form, stores this code word. And then using this code word, the server or multiple servers in their setting can respond to user's queries much faster uh, than in linear time. Uh, in, in, for instance, for some setting of the parameters, uh, you can even have the response times to be, to be uh, n to the 0.6, where n is the database size. However, uh, this approach comes with a cost in that, that the size of this code word that the server needs to store is significantly larger than the original database size. So you get this kind of blow up in the storage requirements of the server. And again, kind of plugging in some parameter setting for this setting of n to the 0.6 uh, query time to get this uh, better query time, the blow up would be cubic. And this is, uh, again, uh, kind of unpractical for large, large uh, databases. And uh, I should mention that more recent work also try and develop a, a similar type of approach of PIR with pre-processing uh, in the single server setting, but there it's actually even uh, a little bit more difficult. So another type of approach has been to try and relax the model and try to get to get to gain some uh, computational benefits uh, in in different models. So um, a very interesting line of works consider the setting where the server can somehow uh, amortize the work by by um, handling a batch of queries. But this, of course, introduces some requirements, uh, additional requirements on the query model. Uh, a different work tries to shard the database and reduce the work of uh, individual servers, but the total amount of work is still linear. And then uh, um, other approaches have been to try and uh, ask for uh, weaker privacy guarantees or for instance, differential privacy. And in this work, we introduce uh, a different model uh, for PIR that tries to, again, kind of circumvent this lower bound and try to get practical uh, computational benefits uh, for PIR. So the plan for this talk is that I'm first going to introduce this offline online PIR model. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about our two server scheme, which is the, um, uh, which was published in the, in the York paper. And then in the second uh, part of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, more recent work, uh, in which we try and uh, kind of improve the scheme and also apply to a particular application of privacy in the browser.
so that's the plan for the talk. And maybe I should have I said earlier, please uh, feel free to stop me and ask any questions uh, at any point. Okay, so let's see, let's, uh, let's look at the model that we consider in our paper. So um, we're gonna mostly focus on the two server case. So we'll have two servers that we assume to be non-colluding. And our protocol consists of two phases. First, in the offline phase, the client talks to one of the servers, the left server, and obtains some piece of information about the database that we call the hint. And uh, the communication is this, in this offline phase uh, should still be sublinear in the database size because we want to rule out trivial protocols in which the, the hint just contains the entire database. And specifically, you can think about the hint as being something like square root n uh, bits long. And um, so the, the, the interesting properties is that first, uh, producing this hint will take linear time for the server. However, uh, what, what, we, what we would like is that th this, this offline phase can take place uh, before the client actually decides on what bit uh, of the database it, it wants to read. So this kind of offers us the opportunity to run this offline phase uh, without any strict latency requirements or in a, say some overnight bad job or something like this. After obtaining this hint, the client store this hint locally and the servers, unlike in the PIR with preprocessing model, just store the database in its original form. So no extra storage on the server and they just store the, they just store the database as is and the client stores this extra piece of information. And then in the online phase, when the client decides on a particular index from the database it wants to read, the client uses its locally stored hint to generate a query to the second server, to the right server. And now um, the server can respond to this query in time, which is sublinear in the database size. And then the client obtains the answer and uses uh, the answer and its locally stored hint in order to produce the value of the bit of interest from the database. And again, the communication, uh, in this online phase, the communication needs to be uh, sublinear in the database size. Uh, I should maybe mention that uh, we're not the first to consider such an offline online model to PIR. And there has been uh, several works that also uh, consider the similar model. Uh, however, in those previous works, either the, the online work of the server was still linear or they require to have some additional storage on the server, whereas we try to avoid, uh, avoid those two um, disadvantages. So now that we've, I should maybe ask, is there any, any, are there any questions about just about the model? Cool. Uh, okay, so let's see what are, we can now state our results uh, in this model. So our first set of results is a two server scheme that uh, achieves square root n communication and square root uh, n uh, online time. And it requires a uh, very mild assumption. So just uh, an existence of a PRG. And all the results that I'm gonna state here, I'm gonna ignore uh, factors that are polynomial in the security parameter lambda and uh, polylogarithmic in the database size n. Though when in the second part, when we'll talk about practical efficiency, we'll, we'll revisit this a little bit. And uh, an extra property that our two server scheme has is that um, we can actually reuse a single offline interaction to make uh, any polynomial number of online queries. This means that this fairly expensive linear time uh, offline phase uh, can be amortized across many queries and then you get even sublinear or square root n uh, amortized total time per query. Uh, in this protocol, the client uses also square root n time and square root n bits of storage. Um, there are also several extensions to, to our protocols that I want to briefly mention. Uh, so first of all, this square root n communication, square root n online time is just a single point on a trade-off curve that we can achieve. And you can kind of trade off uh, communication for online time and vice versa, and then just kind of one setting is just set, you can set both of them to uh, both of them to square root n. I also mentioned that there is we have a statistical security variant that doesn't use any computational assumptions, but this uh, requires more client resources, both communication and time. And uh, kind of towards the other end, uh, we actually have a, uh, we actually have a variant that reduces the online communication 
uh, to log n from square root n to log n online communication. And this is by uh, essentially using some pseudo randomness to compress uh, the client's queries using a, a primitive that we call punctuable sets. Uh, this extension uh, has, the, has the downside that it increases the resources on the client side, so the storage and the time increase to something like n to the uh, 5 over 6. And I, I want to mention that there's a recent work from uh, uh, Elaine et al. that actually shows how to avoid uh, this blow up uh, using a new construction of this punctual set object from uh, privately punctual pseudo random functions that can be, can be built from lattice assumptions. So that's the, that's the first set of results, which is in the two server setting. We also have a, a, a result in the single server setting. Here, uh, we can achieve a, a offline online PIR scheme that achieves n to the two thirds communication and n to the two thirds online time from a bunch of public key uh, assumptions. And if we're willing to make, if we're willing to use heavier cryptographic tools such as FHE, uh, we can actually reduce that to square root n communication and online time. I should say that unlike the two server scheme, the single server scheme is non-refreshable, meaning you, you can only run, uh, you can only run uh, the online phase once after each execution of the offline phase. So you don't get this nice amortization benefit uh, as, we, as, as you do in the two server setting. Um, and, and, and a nice uh, property of the single server scheme that it actually, uh, all the public key crypto is only used in the offline phase. So the, on, the online phase is, uh, is pretty fast from a, from a concrete point of view. And we also complement our results by showing a lower bound in this offline online model. Uh, and I should say that it is in this specific model where the, where the servers store the database in its original form. In this model, we showed that the product of the communication C and the online time T of the server needs to be greater than N. So uh, in, it kind of from, in, in this model, essentially this means that the two server square root N result and the FHE based single server results are optimal, uh, at least if you require the servers to store the database in its original form. Um, yeah, so that's kind of an overview of our results. Uh, it's the, if, if, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Okay, so if there's no questions, I'm gonna go ahead and describe a, in a little more technical detail uh, our two server scheme. So uh, remember we're kind of in this, in this offline online setting. So let's start by describing the offline phase. So to begin the offline phase, the client samples m random subsets uh, of, the, of indices from the universe from 1 to n, where the size of each subset is square root n. And we're going to set the parameter m later. Then the client sends a description of this uh, random subset to the left server. And the left server computes m hint bits, one for each set. Uh, where the hint bit for set M, it's the parity of the database items of the database bits indexed by this particular set. So remember, we're kind of in our, in our setting, the, the, each record is just a bit. So the server computes a parity of the bits pointed by, by each set. This gives you one parity bit per set that the server then sends back to the client. And the client stores as its local hint, a description of this collection of sets and their corresponding parity bits. Then in the online phase, when the client wants to read a particular index from the database, the first thing it does, it scans through its local collection of sets to look for a set that contains index i. If none of the sets contain this index, then the client aborts. And otherwise, it sends what we call a punctured set, which is basically, it takes the set that contains i, remove it, removes index i from the database and sends the set of size square root n minus one to the right server. The right server computes the parity of this set and sends it back to the client. And now the client has two parity bits. One is the uh, bit hj from the hint. And the second is the answer bit. And you can see that the sum of those two bits gives you exactly the value of the bit of interest xi because hj sums all the bits that index by the set and uh, the answer bit A index, indexes the, uh, the, exactly the same bits except, uh, except bit I. So as described, 
this is, uh, this is good in terms of correctness. However, this is not quite secure. And the reason is that as described, the right server actually learns some information about the index i. The reason is that if the set s prime that the, server, the right server sees never contains index i, this kind of leaks, uh, leaks, uh, leaks a little bit of information because the server knows that i cannot be uh, any of the elements that it sees. So to fix this, we kind of tweak the scheme a little bit, and we actually, with some small probability uh, of roughly square root n uh, minus one over n, we uh, actually send a random set to the server that does contain index i. But with the kind of the larger of the two probabilities, which is about one minus one over square root of n, uh, we proceed as before um, and uh, set and remove the index i from the set, and we'll see kind of why why this is helpful. So that's, that's the description of the online phase of our scheme. So let's see kind of, let's go over the, the properties that we care about. So first, in terms of correctness, we can see that there are two failure events that can happen. The first one is that, as we mentioned, the collection might not contain index i to begin with. However, this, if we set the number of sets in the collection to be something like lambda times square root n, where lambda is, is the security parameter, then kind of by a balls and beans argument, we'll get that the failure, this failure probability is negligible uh, in the security parameter. The second problem is that this correct, the correctness equ equation that we've seen before that allows the client to recover the value of its bit of interest doesn't hold uh, in this first case uh, that we introduced for the sake of security. And this creates a non-negligible failure probability of about one over square root of n. So the basic way, kind of the simplest way to fix this is we can actually repeat the, uh, repeat the online phase lambda times in parallel. And then you on, the client only needs to succeed in one of those iterations in order to recover uh, the bit of interest. And this, uh, this, re this drives down the failure probability, uh, again, to be negligible in the security parameter, of course, with a multiplicative cost of lambda uh, in the work and in the communication complexity. So that, that's, that's give, that gives us, uh, over, overall, we get an overwhelming, uh, overwhelming success probability. So let's look at security. So the security holds trivially against the le left server because the client just sends a collection of random sets. This happens even before there is an index i in the picture. So this doesn't leak anything about index i to the left server. Uh, for the right server, this is kind of a, a, little, bit, a little bit trickier, and, but this is where the kind of this tweaked sampling uh, enters. And the reason is that by adjusting this probability of sending a random set that contains index i to the right server, what we get is that the view of the right server is basically a uniformly random set of size square root n minus one. And to get an intuition to why, why is this the case that the server sees a uniformly random set, let's just look at a particular event, which is whether this set, what is the probability that this set contains or doesn't contain i. So based on how we tweak this probability, we can see that with probability square root n minus one over n, we remove, set, uh, remove index i from the set and the set does not contain i. And then with probability, uh, sorry, I might, uh, with probability square root n minus one over n, the set does contain uh, index i. And this is exactly as you would expect it to be for a uniformly random set. So you need to analyze the actual, the, the kind of the, over, the total uh, probability distribution of the set, but it, this is kind of the, the interesting event uh, that you can get an intuition to why the set looks random to the right server. Okay, so now let's, let's just analyze the efficiency of the protocol. So in the offline phase, the client needs to send lambda square root n uh, random sets to the left server and obtain the, the, the hint bits. So uh, tr just naively sending, a naively sending a description of this random sets would take too much communication, uh, but these are just random sets. And so the, the client can just send uh, 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 a seed, a random seed to the, to the server and the left server expand the seed in order to generate, uh, the, generate the, the random sets on the server side and therefore reducing the communication. And then the communication in the offline phase is just dominated by those uh, m or lambda square root n hint bits. And so you get an square root order square root n communication in the offline phase. 
Uh, then in the online phase, the client just needs to send a single set to the right server, and the size of the set is about square root n, uh, and you get just a single bit in return, so the communication in the online phase is all, also square root of n. In terms of the server work, well, in the offline phase, the server needs to process all, all, this, uh, all these sets, and so you get uh, quasi-linear uh, offline time. Uh, for the left server. And then in the online phase, the right server only needs to process a single set. Uh, and this, this requires only square root n time. So uh, the next thing that I, 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 wanna, I wanna describe is this kind of amortization techniques that as I, as I promised, allow us to reuse the offline phase uh, to, uh, to perform multiple online queries. So uh, maybe I should just kind of uh, emphasize the problem uh, uh, and we should maybe just explain why can't we just rerun the online phase as described multiple times after a single execution of the offline phase. And the reason is that the reason for that, why is this is not possible is that the client cannot just naively reuse the same set as J in its collection for more than one query. The reason is that if the same set is used twice for two different indices, then the right server could learn from kind of the slight differences between those two sets or more precisely from their symmetric difference, the right server would be able to learn uh, the indices that the client is reading. So this would completely break security. So somehow what we need to do is once the client uses a particular set, he must throw it away and never use it again. And so our approach is that what we'll basically do is after each query, we'll kind of refresh the local collection of sets uh, of the client by sampling a new set, S new. And to keep the, to keep the hint valid, we, the client also needs to fetch the, uh, the parity bit of this new replacement set. And the client will do it by talking again to the left server, to that same server that uh, participated in the pre-processing phase. So schematically, what you want to do is you want to have the client sample a set, obtain its parity bit, and update uh, its local hint. And then you can just repeat this process again and again to do multiple queries. So let's just fill in the details. So first, the question is, how should the client sample this new set? And unlike in the beginning, in the offline phase, the client cannot just sample the set uniformly at random because the set that is replaced is chosen such that it contains index i. And so uh, you, if you kind of replace a, a, a set that was chosen to contain i with a uniform random set, you would skew the, the distribution. Um, and instead, what the client does, it actually needs to sample a set that contains index i to preserve the, 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 its local distribution. But there, again, you kind of run into the trouble. So you cannot just then send to the left server a set that includes index i. Uh, because this would leak something about I. And what we do is something very similar to what we, uh, to, to what we do when the client talks to the right server. Namely, we, with a large probability, we'll remove this index I from the set and with some small probability, we'll leave it in such that the view of the left server, again, will be a uniformly random set. And then and, uh, the kind of the crucial point is that even if the client retrieves the parity of this set S new prime from which index i was removed, it still it, it can still recover the correct parity bit of the set S new that contains i by basically using the using the fact that it has just learned the value of bit x i from the right server. So I kind of maybe I'll 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 say it again. So the client obtains the value of a set that contains index i by removing the index i, obtaining uh, in a secure way the parity of the set without i, and then kind of a, a applying also the value of the bit i that it's just learned to obtain the correct uh, parity bit. That's, that's the trick. And once the client does that, essentially the, loc the distribution of the hint is kind of preserved between queries and you can rerun this online phase in which each time you talk to the right server and to the left server, you can repeat it any polynomial number of times uh, and amortize the expensive offline phase across queries. That's the idea. And again, kind of this is in the online phase, this left server that participates in the refreshing only needs to process a single set. So the online time is uh, square root n, in particular sublinear in the database size. 
So to sum up the, the two server scheme, we've seen the, the, the kind of as presented, I, we've seen a scheme that achieves square root n communication, square root n online time, and actually square root n amortized total time per query. And the client uh, can actually, by using uh, PRPs, it can actually store those local collection of sets in a way that allows it to uh, process it uh, fast. And again, just the extensions that I mentioned, uh, uh, so you can kind of get a statistical security variant or you can reduce the online communication even further by uh, similarly kind of compressing the description of the set that is sent, uh, sent in the online phase. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the two server part. And I now just wanna say a few words about how can we get a single server offline online PIR scheme. So uh, remember that we, the kind of the, the blueprint is that we have a two server scheme and we somehow want to take those two phases, the offline phase and the online phase and run them on just a single server. That's, I mean, kind of the, uh, what else could you try and do? Uh, but the problem is that the entire security of the, the security of the, of the two server scheme rests on the fact that the, no single server sees both the offline and the online query. So just doing this like this, of course, is, is insecure. And the basic idea is that what we'll do is we'll have the client uh, uh, encrypt, the, encrypt the offline query and have the server homomorphically evaluate the offline algorithm on the encrypted query. This would basically preserve the privacy of the offline query from the server, and then you, you, can, you, can, you can get security as in the two server case. And generally, there are two approaches you can take. So first of all, you can just use a, a fully homomorphic encryption, and then you basically get the, the, you get the same efficiency as in the two-server case, so square root n communication and square root n online time. Of course, concretely, it's going to be much more expensive. The second approach is you can use a lighter tool of additively homomorphic encryption. And by tweaking the offline algorithm, we can express it as a linear operation uh, for which an additively homomorphic encryption suffices. Um, but this comes at the cost that by, by use, the modification actually increases the communication and the online time uh, to, to, to be larger, to be something like n to the two thirds. Um, okay, so uh, that- Yima, I have a question about the previous. Mm -hmm. So does this actually work with the unbounded query setting, the no. single server? So it doesn't. It's not compatible with. Yeah, it, it it's not. Mm -hmm. so yeah, this... I guess that that makes sense because I guess the fully homomorphic encryption is like linear cost. Yeah, I, I, somehow it seems the problem is that you, if you want to to make to make it unbounded, you need to run the uh, you need to run the refreshing phase, and there. You, if you want, you you could potentially you kind of if you want to keep privacy, it's not it's not sufficient to encrypt it, but you somehow need to again to touch all the all the uh, records in the database. So this would increase the online time of the refreshing procedure back to linear, uh, which kind of beats the purpose. I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that's also an interesting question. Like, is it possible to to achieve this in a single server setting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's yeah, also yeah. no no lower bound right for this single server setting, like for uh, the unbounded query setting. If you want to achieve optimality. Yes, actually, so so that's that's a good point because um, I mean the lower bound that we 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 show we show it's kind of uh, even for the single for a single query. So uh, it, you can also ask, can you somehow refine the lower bound to take into account multiple queries? So maybe I mean we don't even know that maybe you can do better than square root of n in amortized cost because the lower bound only kind of captures a offline phase and then a single query. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's only kind of the gap is kind of, we don't, we, so it kind of, we don't know how to achieve even square root of n uh, amortized cost in the uh, single server case, but even the lower bound doesn't, the lower bound doesn't even preclude a better scheme. So you mm -hmm. can maybe even go better uh, if you're doing in, in amortized, uh, in an amortized sense. I see. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks Thanks for the question. Okay, so now the, for the kind of the second part of the talk, I wanna talk about a more recent work in which we apply offline online PIR and, and improve it uh, to target a particular application of uh, 
private browsing uh, or particular, uh, particular privacy application in the browser, to be more precise. So the goal kind of for this, uh, for the second part is that we really wanted to try and evaluate offline online PIR uh, as part of a system for kind of both, bo both to make progress in both directions. So first kind of to inform the design of privacy preserving system and see uh, that PIR is, could be a useful tool for them. And th there have been, of course, works that, uh, that, that explored PIR in, 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 the, in the system setting before. Um, and then we also want to get a better understanding of the different performance concerns or performance metric and see kind of what's, uh, what are the right questions uh, about PIR from a more theoretical perspective as well. So uh, to put this offline online PIR scheme to the test, what we did, we built a system for private safe browsing queries. And I'm going to describe what, the, what is the safe browsing mechanism in, in a bit. Then we integrated this, uh, this PIR system in, into the Firefox browser, and uh, we evaluated its performance. And we, uh, and we see that this new offline online PR scheme allow us to use uh, 7x less server time than uh, the kind of state of the art uh, regular uh, two server PIR schemes. Uh, but this comes at the cost of, of, of a 3x higher bandwidth. So you, you, gain, uh, you gain a bit, you lose, you lose somewhere else. And this is again, compared to a DPF based PIR, which are kind of the, very simple and very efficient to server PIR schemes. Uh, Dima, I guess I have a question about the comparison. So like this DPF based PIR that you compared to, like which is the actual scheme you compared with? What's the name of the paper that that's your oh, baseline? Uh, so this is uh, Boyle Gilboa Shai from CCS 16, I think. Uh, they have like mm -hmm. they have a sequence of work, and the recent one it's basically the ones that is uh, uh, tree based. That's the one that we that we that we compare against. So that that one is like the state of the art before your work. I, there's also a bunch of other papers, right? Like there's one by Sebastian Angel and others. I forgot the name. And there's yeah. also so how do like these existing implementations compare? So um, S Sebastian Angels, if you're referring to uh, CLPR and Punk, this is in the single server setting. So this uh -huh. is kind of a, in, a, in a different model. I, I mean, we, this, th those schemes are much less efficient, but of course it's kind of an incomparable security model. And I think in the two server setting, the, the DPF based are, I, I, okay, I can actually, I, I can actually say that the, the reason that the DPF, it, it actually turns out that even for uh, uh, the DPF based scheme, the bottleneck is actually not in the in the expansion of the query, but it turns out that the bot that the bottleneck is actually in the memory access to just do the linear uh, probes, the, the linear amount of probes uh, to fetch all the all all the records from memory. So in some sense, it's kind of even if you get uh, if you would improve the uh, com the computational efficiency, say of the DPF based scheme. Um, it would the bottleneck is the is the linear um, the linear time uh, memory access on the server uh, on the server yes yes on the server so th those the, the previous thing doesn't have pre processing that you compare with and that's right why they have right I see. right 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 and in terms of communication then yeah I think that scheme is also essentially it's kind of lambda login um, yeah you could I don't, I'm not sure about the the any lower bonds, but yeah, I mean, presumably you can get better in terms of communication, but in terms of uh, which which we 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 kind of lose uh, on, but in terms of computation, um, it seems kind of intrinsic in the in the no preprocessing linear time approach. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so let me just describe first start by describing the the design of the system and. The, the, to start, I'm just going to describe how the existing safe browsing, what is the existing safe browsing mechanism and how it works. So you might be familiar with this screen that you get if you go to a uh, click on some bad, bad, uh, bad link that your browser, whether it's Chrome or Firefox, warns, warns you that you're about to enter a, a dangerous website. And the way that this works, this is actually, uh, this is actually uh, the browser uses a mechanism called safe browsing that is initially was implemented by Google who, who are one service provider, but there are compatible implementations both by uh, Yandex and, and Tencent. And 
basically what Google do, they uh, compile a list, they kind of crawl the web, they compile a, a large list of dangerous uh, URLs. And then the client needs to just query this, uh, query this, uh, this, this, collect, this list of, of URLs to check whether, uh, whether it's, it's, it's the URL it's about to enter uh, is dangerous or not. And the way that it works, so to kind of make things more efficient, uh, Google actually ship a compressed representation, which you can think of as kind of as a bloom filter of, of the sets of URL uh, to, to the client. And this is, the set contains a partial hash. So 32 bits out of the 256 bit uh, SHA hash, um, this partial 32 bit hash is sent to the, sent to the client. And then when the client wants to, uh, wants to basically before any resource, resource that the client, uh, the browser fetches, it hashes the, hashes the local URL. And I gave this example here of this URL because this was actually both a malware site, but also kind of used to try and uh, uh, track people in China. And so it, seemed, it shows this kind of conflict between you want to avoid the malware, but even like knowing that you are about to enter this malware page can be, some, can be, can be sensitive information uh, of the user. Uh, anyhow, the client hashes this URL and then it first checks its, its local uh, list of URLs, if, whether it contains this partial hash. If the partial hash doesn't appear on the, on the list, then this surely it also doesn't appear on the full list. So this is a safe URL and the client just continues browsing. Otherwise, it needs to check whether this is a dangerous URL or it's just kind of a hash collision uh, and a false positive, in which case the client queries the server, sends the partial hash, obtains the full hash, and then compares uh, the full hashes, again, to check whether this was a false positive or this is, in fact, a dangerous URL, in which case you get this uh, red warning screen. And there's actually, there's been several works that analyze that even this partial hash that you reveal to the, to, to the service provider, uh, this actually uh, leaks uh, kind of a non-trivial amount of information about your browser history uh, to, to, the, uh, to the service provider. They can infer uh, with, I mean, they can learn both about which dangerous sites you, you mentioned or get, or, or, or kind of get a small list of potential uh, hash collisions or of, of other websites that you could be, uh, could be browse, browsing. So the goal is somehow to, uh, our, the goal of our, of our system is to kind of reduce this privacy leakage that exists here. And this is actually not only, uh, it's not a concern that only, only we had. In fact, Apple, uh, they, were, they were kind of worried about this privacy leakage on their iPhones that Safari also uses this service providers. And so what they, 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 what they do in iOS 14.5 is they actually have a proxy server that anonymizes, that kind of proxies all the requests to, the Google, to Google and anonymize them. So at least the service provider doesn't see the content of the request and the IP address of the client uh, at the same time. So this is kind of a different type of solution. And our solution is to replace this query mechanism with a PIR-based private query mechanism. And uh, we have our, we kind of, we built a system that runs, uh, that we run on two servers uh, for, which we assume to be non-colluding. So in practice, this could be like Google and Mozilla or some other two parties or Google and Apple. And then we, we just, it's kind of, it fits the design of the system very naturally because we just need to replace this single, uh, this online query with a PIR based query. And from the perspective of the browser, everything else remains the same. Uh, maybe the only thing that's may unclear uh, is, well, we want to use an offline online PIR scheme. So we somehow need to run the offline phase, but this also fits the design of the system pretty well because the client, the browser regularly fetches this list of partial hashes from the uh, service provider from Google, and we can just use this exact same opportunity uh, to download and uh, to download a hint, um, download a, the hint required for our offline online PIR based scheme. Uh, that's that's kind of the general design, but of course there. Are, if you want to kind of look at the details, there are, there are some uh, practical problems and, and improvements that needs to be done, and I want to briefly talk about uh, I guess about one of them. So uh, I should say that the uh, different challenges that we, that we needed to overcome is first, when I presented the results you know, in the beginning, we, we ignored all those factors of Lambda, polylog N, we only cared about the symptotic efficiency. Uh, 
if you want, if you care about concrete efficiency, you need to be a bit more careful. And in fact, we have a new version of our PIR scheme uh, in our in our second paper that uh, improves the online time of our scheme by a factor of lambda. And this is basically the 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 the, the way to do it is is kind of get rid of this imperfect correctness that I mentioned that was the source of this lambda times uh, lambda times replication that causes uh, the blow up in the online time. And the details are in the paper. I, I won't have time to cover this uh, today. Um, the second the second thing is that unlike what we assumed to begin to begin with, the database is constantly changing. So we cannot just assume that it's a once and for all static database and we need to handle updates. And finally, we need to also handle this, also what I mentioned in the beginning, we need to handle the lookups to be done by index or this key, we need to provide this dictionary interface rather than look up by index. For this, there are kind of standard techniques of PIR by keywords. Um, and we actually do some, big, we kind of do a co-design with a safe browsing system that allows us to get uh, uh, something more specific that is more efficient for, for our case. Again, uh, kind of the, the details are, are in the paper. Um, so I only want to give uh, kind of a little bit of an idea of how, the, how do we handle updates because it's kind of a, um, I think it's, it's not too difficult to explain. So basically, I should just say that this is only a problem because of the offline online nature of our scheme. In standard PIR, this isn't a problem because if you, you can always just do the online only query, just run it against the latest copy of the database and there's no state on the client, no state on the server. So you can just, uh, you don't run into any problems if you have, uh, um, if you, if, if you have database updates. However, in the offline online phase, the client stores this hint, and now you run into kind of a state discrepancy between the client state and the, and the actual database. And if you just wanna process this naively, you need to rerun the offline phase after each change. And remember our offline phase is kind of expensive. So this would result in a linear amount of, of server work on each change. And uh, our refined approach, which is actually uh, inspired by uh, very similar uh, ideas uh, in the data structure literature and as well as in, in, in crypto for things like ORAM and uh, updatable encryption and this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, what we do is we do incremental pre-processing that uh, allows us to reduce the amount of work that the server needs to do on each change to be logarithmic uh, in the database size rather than linear as in the naive solution. And the way to do it is we essentially review our database as kind of a collection of buckets and we process the updates using the following two rules. So first, every new record gets inserted into a new bucket. And second, whenever you have two buckets of the same size, you just merge them together. So you start off with maybe a, uh, an existing bucket and then you get a new, data, new record, you insert it into a new bucket. Then you have another one, you merge them, you get a bucket of size two and so on and so forth. So you kind of keep adding buckets and merging buckets. And uh, the idea is that now you have at most logarithmic uh, amount of, and a logarithmic number of buckets at each point because you, you have at most one bucket of each size and you always double the size of the bucket. And using this approach, we can actually get a much better uh, offline, a much better offline time for each update. Specifically, whenever a bucket is created, we now run the pre-processing phase only on this bucket and the client fetches a hint, just uh, basically holds a hint for each bucket. Uh, so whenever you get a new bucket, the client gets a new hint. And the idea is that now you have at most, uh, you will have a, at, at most a logarithmic overhead in the amount of pre-processing because every record will be processed at most one at each level. So when you have at most log n level, so for each record, you'll only do uh, a logarithmic uh, amount of, um, uh, you'll process it log, log n times. And then in term, how do you do the online phase with this scheme? Now, when you want to query a particular index, you, the client first looks in which bucket, uh, in, in which bucket uh, it belongs. Uh, and this is kind of where it, it, it need, you need to take into account this PIR by keywords that we mentioned. But just for now, think about it, that you want to process an index uh, in the stream of records that uh, uh, this continuous stream of records. So you can map it into a particular, in particular bucket, and then the client can use this hint in order to generate, uh, to generate a query. However, to avoid leaking the bucket to which the record belongs, which of course would break privacy, the client also sends dummy queries uh, for the remaining buckets, gets the server process all, all 
queries and the client just recovers the correct value from the from the from the from the from the right answer and this again this you could you could think it maybe also results in a logarithmic blow up but here because the size of the bucket is actually decreasing uh, if you do the sum it's only you only get a constant constant overhead uh, in server time uh, so that's a, that's a, uh, a simple way to reduce uh, to reduce the preprocessing time even uh, if you have updates uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is just to show you some show you some uh, preview of the results in terms of the performance of the system. So what we did, we implemented our system kind of in Go and the critical parts, we also did it in C. Um, and then for the experiments, we ran, uh, basically we, 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 we ran our system as a, to, as a proxy that proxies all save browsing, requ save browsing requests uh, from you know just our daily acti daily browsing activities, and we recorded all the query pattern uh, from which you can see both the size of the database, the frequency and size of the updates, and how often does the user makes queries. So you kind of learn uh, the usage pattern, and then we we can then replay this uh, this uh, trace, this recorded trace of queries and updates and with all those parameters to measure the throughput and communication of our system. So uh, just the kind of a two, two highlights of the results. So on the left, you can basically see the um, server resources for, for uh, running the system. So we can see a graph that shows the throughput of the system measured in the number of users it can handle uh, and the latency for the queries uh, that it provides to the user. And I should just say the reason that we can kind of we can we can measure the throughput in number of users because from our experiment we can kind of we can basically translate every user based on the based on the recorded usage pattern to to a particular amount number of updates per second, a particular amount of queries per second, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in fact, every user queries the system only one only kind of few minutes, few times per hour because of the local caching mechanism. Uh, so you can kind of see in, in gray, you 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 can see the non-private baseline, and this can handle about 10 million users from a single server. And you can see that our, our offline online scheme is you, you kind of, you lose about factor of, a factor of 20 uh, compared to the non-private baseline, but you're about seven times faster, you're, you get seven times better throughput than the DPF-based scheme with linear online time. And this, I should say that here the throughput also measures the offline time that you that that uh, that uh, that you need to do. So kind of you, you this is a mixed workload of uh, of the pre-processing and the online queries. And then in terms of communication, this is where we pay, and it turns out that we the the main uh, difference in communication because you can see the in, in red. This is our uh, this is our uh, our offline online scheme in blue. This is our system implemented with the DPF based PIR, and you can see that the main cost of the communication is actually in the offline phase, this uh, light pink one, and the reason is that actually basically the, the size of the, the communication of updating the hints, even this factor that we get uh, from uh, from supporting updates, this co constant overhead still kind of adds up, and this is why we we lose. Uh, in communication compared to the online on the scheme. Uh, Dima, just, just out of curiosity, like, um, you know, in, in terms of the response time perceived by the user, like is the server computation the bottleneck here or the communication uh, the uh, bottleneck here? So in terms of the user's experience, I would say that the, the, the latency is not like, yeah, even the, yeah, the, the, the bottleneck is the communication, like just talking, you get like 20 milliseconds or whatever, talking to your nearest Google server and the server processing is fast. But if you, take, if you think about the cost to the service provider, this is where basically, this is the thing that we've tried to optimize in some sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think even, e, 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 even like, I would say that even the existing PIR solutions in terms of the user experience, they're definitely good enough. And now the questions, mm -hmm. you know, you can think about the, how, how you can convince service providers to run them and our, our idea is that basically you want to make it as cheap for them uh, as possible mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense um yeah that's uh that's kind of the preview of the results and i just want to conclude by maybe giving a few lessons that i personally learned by um more from working on this kind of second part of this of, of of implementing the system and and working on the practical aspects of it is that first as i said two server pir i would say is, seems to be 
to my opinion, practical for this kind of moderate size databases. I should have said earlier, but this safe browsing database has about 3 million uh, SHA-256 hashes. Uh, and for this, uh, in terms of, yeah, just as, as, as Elaine asked, is even, even the, the latency is totally okay using this two-server PR scheme. And now it's kind of the question of cost for the server. Um, from the kind of the, the, the research lessons learned is that I think one lesson that I've personally learned is kind of the importance of evaluating such systems end to end as early as possible. So this means in this kind of system, try and get some kind of prototype with, uh, you know, measure, measure the traffic pattern, uh, measure the size of the database, try and, and build a prototype and plug in existing PIR schemes to see what are the things that needs, uh, need improvement the most. And this will kind of guide you in optimizing uh, the important parts of the system. And then also in this, especially I think in, in, in our initial paper, and I think in PIR in general, there's like a, the design space is really big in terms of you have like offline, online scheme, online scheme, like trading off communication, uh, computation, and there's really a lot of metrics. And so, it's, I think what, what helps in doing kind of this uh, complementary systems work, it really helps you to focus in terms of uh, how do you want to, like what, what parts of the design space you want to explore and whether what particular metrics you want to optimize. And I think this, this is really helpful and I personally learned a lot from it. And that's all what, what I had for today and I'm happy to take any, any more questions. So what you implemented is pretty cool. Like, have you talked to Google, like, to see if they might be interested to deploy it? Uh, we've sent, so we've we kind of talked to the Safe Browsing team early on before we started on the project, just to get some more information. And now, more recently, we send them the we send them the paper. Um, and yeah, I hope they hope. I mean, I hope we didn't get a response yet. So I hope they're uh, they're considering this. Um, yeah, that would be that would be cool. I think whether it would be super cool whether they decide to use ours, like the offline online scheme, or even just use the DPF based scheme because it is simpler. So I think that you can, I mean, both either either would be great. I think yours is also very simple, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, from the crypto perspective, definitely it has a little bit more complexity because of the offline phase. But as you've seen, I mean, we kind of it's not too many mm -hmm. lines of code as we have built, and you get a much better, uh, you get a much better uh, computational cost. I, I, maybe I, and I just another thing. I think it could all, it, this this uh, application of safe browsing. It in some sense this is uh, just a particular example of a uh, of basically a very slight generalization of of block lists of just looking up. This, it turns out that this table of few million SHA-256 hashes that the client needs to query, it's, it comes up a lot. Uh, uh, so Apple used this, a similar design uh, for uh, like any executable you ran on Mac OS. They, wanna, they have a database of dangerous, of malware basically. And bef before you run an, ex before your operating system agrees to run an executable, it queries this database so it could fit, fit in there. Um, um, revoked certificate is also a similar application. Uh, so this is kind of one reason we looked at it because it's it's I, here I focused on safe browsing, but it is it is a bit more general than this. So yeah, yesterday, um, Rex uh, Rex Fernando he pointed to me a very interesting application. So there's this website called uh, Have You Been Pwned? So essentially they have a database of leaked passwords and you can go to their webpage, you can enter your password and check to see if your password has been compromised. So, so there it seems like if you have a website like that, you know, you really don't want to enter your password <laughs> and you really need like something like private information retrieval. But I think for this case, like the database is um, probably much bigger. I think it's more than just a few million entries because the many passwords have been leaked. <laughs> Uh, yes, that, I think that's a great application. So I think this not only have it been pawned, even this is actually built into Chrome now, I think. So, and I think Google, they actually use um, uh, private sentence, some sort of private set intersection for this application. Uh, but you get some, but the, the current design actually leaks a little, a few bits of the password hash uh, because of computational, um, because, to save computation. So I think this could also PIR, would apply there as well. 
Um, and I think two, two things actually that you said, I think it's a good point. So about the size, my guess it would be maybe, you know, an order of magnitude bigger, but not, I don't think there's like a, a billion passwords. It's probably like tens of millions at most, my, my guess would be. Um, and second, there, the current, their current design that uses private set intersection also has some privacy requirements for the server. Uh, so they don't want just to ship this, uh, you know, to reveal all those, uh, uh, all, all the leaked passwords hashes to the to the client. So, uh, but this you can kind of do by either rate limiting the queries, or you can do st there are standard techniques in which you can basically turn a PIR scheme into a PIR scheme that has privacy. What's called SPIR, uh, and that's basically you encrypt all the records, and then you you use an oblivious PRF to just decrypt uh, individual records. Um, so I think this could also, in some sense, PIR would be a very good fit for this application as well. So Google is, uh, Chrome is using this to make sure people select secure passwords when they sign up for their account? Uh, yeah, notify, and even I think proactively notify you of if password that you selected in the, there's like, you can do a password checkup health thing. Uh, this is, I think, a paper from Usenix from two years ago. Uh, they, they explained this design. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So the yeah, paper is from like cool. Google? The, the uh, it's Google. I think actually Dan also worked with them on, on, on this paper as well. Uh, I think oh, this is cool. Usenix, Usenix 19. Uh, and yeah, they use they use uh, they use private set intersection, and they leak. And I think and if I'm not mistaken, there's a little bit of a few bits of leakage there uh, of the hash. Mm -hmm. So if you go to this website, have I been pawned? Apparently, they have uh, 10, 10 billion. 10 billion. Wow. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I could have been wrong. Yeah. 10 billion. That's uh, a, a password for each uh, global citizen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I think, I think then, I mean, you could, yeah, you could, you could always, so yeah, you could either pay the cost. You can decide you might, you, you might settle on a smaller anonymity set. Mm, I mean, yeah, there, you're, you, could, you could compromise it, I would say, maybe. Okay, I guess um, if there's no other question, let's thank Dima again. That's really a cool work. Thank I you very much for having me. I, will, I really like the two faces algorithm for the two servers. Okay, thanks for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.